Hello, everybody. Welcome back to AP World History with your boy, Mr. Ansharsky. This is chapter six of unit one, and we're going to talk about what's going on in North and South America prior to Christopher Columbus. And we refer to this as pre-Columbian America. So let's look at societies in North and South America, especially paying attention to how governments form over time and how they maintained power. Oh my God, all right. So yes, we are gonna look at what we refer to as historians, as state building, meaning how are empires, how are governments, how are kingdoms being set up in North and South America? So that is the lesson objective for today. Remember, this is what you are responding to on that uh, the unit worksheet. Explain how and why societies in the Americas developed and changed over time. So you should be answering with evidence the how and the why. Excellent. All right. So let's first look at a region of North America that is sometimes called Mesoamerica or Central America. Sometimes people call it. But first, as usual, geography. Let's look at geography here. Well, it's important to remember that Mesoamerica is kind of a mix between two basic uh, forms of geographic terrain. In some parts of Mesoamerica, including southern Mexico, we do have kind of a mixture between mountains, very dry, semi-arid mountains, but also you have dense tropical forests as you get closer and closer to the Caribbean, as you get closer and closer to South America. And we'll see that how this kind of natural environment is going to impact what societies form and how they form in Mesoamerica. But another thing that's kind of important about North and South America in general is that you don't really have what we call beasts of burden, meaning you don't have animals like horses, you don't have animals like um, donkeys or mules. These are gonna be things that come from the old world. So right now we don't really have many domesticated animals. We do have turkeys, but we don't have anything in the way of horses or mules. The horse will be introduced to North America once the Spanish get there. We have llamas in South America, but we'll talk about them more later. But right now in Mesoamerica, no beasts of burden. But we also see that there is going to be a change in how these societies will adapt to their natural environment. As with uh, Eurasia, as with Africa, as we'll see, many of these societies prior to the rise of civilization, they're mostly going to be engaged in slash and burn agriculture or Swidden agriculture, as it's sometimes called. But as states develop, as more complex societies develop, we will see the uh, ability to create more complicated forms of irrigation, more complicated forms of agricultural production. And largely, we do see these developments occur around the kind of limited water resources, at least in terms of kind of open water resources, on the, in, uh, excuse me, in Central America. So we are gonna see that several societies will adapt to their natural environment by kind of creating agricultural forms that do well in their natural environment. So we will see that largely these civilizations, especially the, uh, the Mayan and the Aztec, they will develop around key lakes um, in Central America. This is Lake Texcoco in modern day Mexico. It doesn't exist really anymore, but we'll talk about that later. Uh, this is where the Aztec will pop up and they will develop kind of very complicated forms of agricultural production. They will create a system of artificial islands called uh, Chiampas. We also see complex uh, canal building, irrigation along the shores of Lake Texcoco. But we also see that there is swamp draining as well, kind of reclaiming land in order to build more complicated forms of agriculture. We also see kind of the, I don't want to say exploitation, but the use of natural aquifers as well. We do see as well that many societies in Mesoamerica 
they will form around areas that have what we call cenotes. These are kind of, they're mostly underground lakes, but there's a hole at the top where you can see everything. So that's what geography looks like. And kind of in answering that daily summary and answering that lesson objective, you could say that we see the adaptation of the natural environment through more complex forms of agricultural production, say the uh, Chiampas, the artificial islands, and we'll talk about them more later with the Aztec. But in general, societies in Mesoamerica are going to be very similar. And we do see that they will build upon each other, essentially. They will kind of take the uh, same social, religious, political uh, structures, artistic and cultural structures, and adapt them for their own purposes. So many of these societies in Mesoamerica, these are some similarities, and I'm going to go into more detail about them in just a second, but we do see that Mesoamerica is highly urbanized, meaning that there's a lot of cities, it's kind of densely populated areas, especially around key water resources like Lake Texcoco. We see that generally these societies are very militaristic, meaning they have big military culture, meaning they have large militaries. We know that they also have polytheistic religions, meaning of course they have multiple gods. But in these polytheistic religions, as we will see, there often are similar gods and similar practices. One of the most notable and uh, uh, coolest, well, not coolest, but one of the most notable, of course, being human sacrifice. And we'll talk about the political and religious purpose of this in a second, but it is a strategy, it is a belief practice that is employed by other civilizations. Uh, throughout Mesoamerica. We know that there was strict class hierarchies, oftentimes at the top would be the priestly class, the clergy is another word for that, uh, but also of course the nobility, they are at the top of this social pecking order, so to say. So we do have a very rigid class-based society where religion and secular politics, meaning non-religious politics, are often intertwined. Religion and state, they are together, not separate. But we also know that these societies will have similar economies, they have similar agricultural practices, they engage in trade, there's evidence of trade with places across Mesoamerica, throughout Mexico, even as far as North America, uh, similar kind of culture and such. All right. And one of the kind of earliest civilizations that will adopt many of these practices that will be kind of the model for the Aztec and the Maya is the city of Tenochtitlan. And I am mispronouncing that. I am very sorry to all you uh, Mesoamerican heads out there. But Tenochtitlan is going to be one of the kind of premier of these Mesoamerican societies. It is a city state. It does have a very strong urban population. And it is going to kind of take on and first represent a lot of the ideas of future Mesoamerican societies. They will adopt, excuse me, they will create many of the religious ideas, many of the religious practices, political practices that will be carried over to the Aztec and the Maya after that. So in terms of religion, we know a few things about, well, actually, we know quite a lot about uh, religion in early Mesoamerica. We know it's polytheistic. There's an importance of the sun, the moon. Uh, also, this handsome gentleman, a guy by the name of Quetzalcoatl. And you don't need to know exactly kind of the specifics about religion in Mesoamerica. But what is significant is that religion will be adapted and copied by future Mesoamerican societies. All of these deities, the sun, the moon, Quetzalcoatl right here, a snake human person thing, they're all going to be gods in Mayan civilization. They'll be gods in Aztec civilization as well. So there is this idea of animism, that there is a spirit of God associated with inanimate objects. But also another practice that will be uh, developed by the Tenochtitlan city-state is going to be the practice of human sacrifice. 
And human sacrifice, as we're going to see with the Aztec especially, it is largely going to serve two purposes. Religiously, it's to appease the sun god, mostly. But politically, and that's the more important one, the idea of human sacrifice is more so kind of a display of power. It's a way to show to conquered people, especially, that we are the stronger military force, the stronger culture. We can sacrifice your prisoners of war. And largely these prisoners of war, they would come from the noble classes, the ones that would be sacrificed anyway. But also we do see that war serves an economic purpose as well, in addition to fulfilling this requirement of gaining human sacrifices or gain slaves as well. So we do see a very slave-based economy in Tenochtitlan and in future Mesoamerican societies. But we also know that they are largely going to be a trade-based society. They also develop kind of agricultural practices that will be employed by the Aztec, by the, the Maya, including kind of early, kind of that slash and burn technique, but also later these ideas of the floating islands, the chiampas, of irrigation, of canals. So we'll talk more about human sacrifice in just a second. Yummy. All right. Another society that does form in Mesoamerica is going to be the Mayan civilization. And the Mayan civilization is less of a single unified empire, but more of a series of city-states that have similar culture. So it's kind of like the Greeks in a way, in the sense that uh, Greek civilization is not a unified thing, at least during the classical period, but it is more so a collection of politically independent states that have a similar religious and pol uh, political practices, but not the same government, essentially. Ooh, I got a net, awesome. We also know that there is a similarity in this idea of monument building. And you can see an example of a Mayan temple right here. It's oftentimes in a pyramid uh, shape. Uh, it does have kind of uh, religious housing, not housing, but the, uh, the actual building itself where ceremonies take place up here on the top. But these monuments are important for a few things. For one thing, they represent kind of how the idea of the lack of beast burdens feeds into class-based hierarchies. Most of these monuments, actually all of them, I should say, they're built with slaves. They are built with manual labor without the assistance of horses, without the assistance of pack mules. But another thing that's important about these monuments is that they represent a shared culture among uh, Mesoamerican societies, among the Mayan uh, initially. But another significance is that they have a religious and scientific purpose. These temples oftentimes are created with the intention of being aligned with the, the planets, with the moon, with, with the moons, with the moon, or with the stars. So they're basically kind of observatories in a way. And because of these religious and quasi-scientific buildings, we do see that the Mayan have a lot of intellectual advances, especially in the area of astronomy. We see that the Mayan famously, you might have heard of this before, they develop a astronomically accurate calendar. Uh, they also, of course, develop a writing system that will be employed by future Mesoamerican societies, this kind of hieroglyphic uh, uh, language system, written language system. And then one more thing about the Mayan I just forgot to mention up there is that the Mayan as a kind of ethnic or cultural group, they still exist to this day in places like Southern Mexico, in places like uh, uh, Guatemala and Nicaragua. Uh, that's not without uh, kind of pushback against uh, largely white societies, first with the, the colonies, with the Spanish colonies, then with Mexico, then with, uh, well, the United States does a little bit of CIA trickery, but we'll get there later. And then finally, just one more thing about the Mayan is their ideas of religion, which is going to be very influential in how the Aztec will build their civilization. So, much like with Tenochtitlan, much like that, that earlier city-state that I mentioned, we do have 
largely warfare serving a religious and political purpose. Uh, obviously, religiously, it's for the intention of human sacrifices. It's with the intention of pleasing the divine world, namely the sun god, whose name I cannot pronounce for the life of me. But warfare, of course, is a political tool as well, if you haven't catched that, if you haven't picked that up in human history so far. Warfare, of course, expands territory. It expands natural resource acquisition, especially through things like paying tribute. But also warfare does serve that religious role. It's to gain human sacrifice victims, i.e. members of the noble class mostly. This is a political purpose. It's literally removing the nobility, or at least some of the nobility, in conquered places. It's a clear demonstration of political power. But also, slavery is going to be something that results from these warfares. Oftentimes, commoners captured during war, they are going to be used as slaves in these Mesoamerican societies. And the Mayan kind of will be absorbed into other empires. They'll also kind of continue as city-states, really until our uh, dear enemies, the Spanish, get there in the 1500s, but we'll talk about that much more later on. But perhaps the most notable of these Mesoamerican societies has to be our boys in the city of Tenochtitlan, Tenochtitlan the Aztec. So let's look at the origins of our friends, the Aztec. Well, much like other societies in North and South America, the Aztec are largely going to build upon the legacy, both literally and uh, figuratively, of the, Tolt of the Toltec Empire. Uh, so this represents that general trend of these empires in Mesoamerica that do build upon earlier civilizations, that build upon the uh, cultural, political, and artistic legacies of earlier empires. In the case of the Aztec, it's the Toltecs. And they're also going to kind of build upon the language of the uh, Toltec, and that is going to be the language of Nahuatl, which is uh, kind of the language family of a lot of Native American languages in Mesoamerica, in Central America. Eventually, the Toltec do collapse, and we do see a series of independent city-states, of highly urbanized regions across this key lake in southern Mexico, in Lake Texcoco. And one of these city-states is going to be home to a group of previously nomadic people called the Mexica, or the, the Aztec, who do settle in the city of Tenochtitlan. And Tenochtitlan is going to become the capital of the Aztec. But unfortunately for the Aztec, their city is on an island. And islands are terrible in world history because there's limited amount of space. There's limited amount of space for people and agriculture and in general, natural resources. So how do you get more land for people, more land for agriculture? Well, you can make floating islands as we'll talk about later, but in the long term, to get natural resources, especially building materials, i.e. stone, but also precious metals, jade, uh, or not jade, that doesn't exist, um, uh, feathers and animal furs, you have to expand. And we do see that the Aztec adopting a very militaristic culture that earlier Mesoamerican societies had, they're going to aggressively expand across Lake Texcoco and they will form an empire. They will uh, take over um, and rule over the region of Lake Texcoco, especially over these cities along this key important lake in southern Mexico. So let's look at how the Aztec, well, we looked at how they uh, developed. Let's look at how they maintained power over time. Well, the Aztec Empire is an extremely centralized one, meaning that there is unquestionably one person in charge, the emperor. There is unquestionably a center of this empire in the city of Tenochtitlan. So there is a highly organized political structure uh, and it's allowing for this empire to exist, to develop and maintain its hold over Lake Texcoco. 
But there are other strategies that kind of go into this idea of a highly centralized monarchy, a highly centralized uh, position of an emperor. And that's going to be through the use of the tribute system. And we've talked about a tribute system before. We talked about what was going on in China with the Central Asian nomads. But the tribute system in the Aztec Empire works basically the same way. So conquered people from the Aztec, they would be kind of forced, they would be demanded to give tribute to the Aztec, to the Aztec's capital of Tenochtitlan. So we do see that there is this system to maintain natural resource extraction by demanding tribute from conquered people. And the Aztec, they would have these things called tribute lists. I, I'm showing you an example right here. Basically, it's a kind of pictorial representation of what the Aztec demand from conquered people. And in this case, they're demanding things like jaguar furs, like, I actually don't know, is that a jaguar? It could be. But animal furs in general, precious metal, i.e. gold, spice, or not spices, uh, food in general, but also slaves, also natural resources, like building materials, i.e. stone. But we also see that the Aztec maintain their power through this idea of human sacrifice. As I've been mentioning countless times before, it serves two roles. Religiously, it's to satisfy the big guy in the sky, or at least one of them, in this case, the sun god. Um, and I am not going to try and pronounce his name, unfortunately. Or actually, you know what, I will, just for, just for some giggles. Um, or maybe I'd offend people if I do that. I probably shouldn't. Uh, <sighs> the dilemma of world history with Mr. Ancharsky. I cannot pronounce anything outside of Germany. And that's because, only because I took German in college and high school. But anyway, so religiously, obviously, human sacrifice serves its role in satisfying the divines. But politically, of course, what is the purpose of human sacrifice? It's a very dramatic way to show that you're in charge of everybody. So we often do see that prisoners of war, that those from the noble classes, they'd be extracted a sense, in a sense, and they would kind of serve a purpose of being a human sacrifice. We would see that these nobles, they would serve that religious uh, satisfaction for this divine world, but also it's a clear demonstration of power. And oftentimes that's going to be solidified, you could say, by the kind of ceremony of ripping out the heart and then a ah, little yummy bite. Uh, so there is kind of a religious and political purpose to all of this human sacrifice. It's a demonstration of power. It's a part of that tribute system. But another way that the Aztec maintain power and something that won't make them very popular Demanding tribute from people doesn't make you very popular, by the way, in case you were wondering. But in terms of another way to maintain power, the Aztec are going to develop a very stratified, very rigid hierarchy of class. So this class is largely going to be pretty immovable, meaning that with few exceptions, marriage being one of them, you can't really move up in this social hierarchy. And largely this social hierarchy is determined by family or clan loyalty called the Kalpuyi. And the Kalpuyi essentially are kind of different classes of people. And really your family remains in that class for the most part. You don't necessarily need to memorize this hierarchy right here, but it is a very rigid and strict one. We have an emperor at the top. This is Emperor Montezuma II. We'll talk about him later. But there is also uh, kind of this close association between political leaders, i.e. the emperor and the nobility, but also religious ones as well. So there is a merging, a blending of the secular and religious institutions in Aztec society. And of course, at the bottom being slaves. But in terms of gender, we do see kind of this idea of hierarchy being imposed. It is a largely patriarchal society. Women don't really have any political roles. They do have economic ones. They can own property. They can be merchants. They can go outside the home. But largely, they are expected to be the domestic or uh, kind of 
uh, person in charge of the household, meaning they're the ones doing the cooking, they're the ones supervising the rearing of children, etc. We also see kind of there's a distinction in uh, kind of marriages as well for upper class people, for upper class men mostly. They can have multiple wives, the nobility. They often do engage in polyam or um, not polyamorous, polygamous, <laughs> uh, polygamous uh, relationships, whereas lower class people are expected to have one wife, monogamy. Monogamy, indeed, yes. So a very rigid class based society where there's limited social mobility. We also have this very cruel uh, treatment of conquered people, very dramatically expressed through tr the tribute system, but also human sacrifice. But let's look at the economy, because there are some developments here that are unique to the Aztec, but also demonstrate another way they're maintaining at least economic and uh, po population, or at least economic power, but also sustaining their population. So they are gonna be a largely trade-based society. The tribute system kind of allows for that insofar as all these natural resources, they have to be facilitated by somebody. Why not be the merchant class? So there is a very strong merchant class in Aztec society, and we do see a trade between conquered people and the Aztec through that tribute system. So slaves, of course, are exchanged, but also kind of things like Feathers, furs, animal skins, precious metals, cocoa leaves, uh, chocolate is an Aztec invention, so we have them to thank or curse for that. I don't know who would curse them for that. Maybe like, maybe like Willy Wonka's dad or whatever in the movie with Johnny Depp, you know, it's like Christopher Lee or whatever. He's like, no chocolate for you. Or no, that, that's a pretty good Christopher Lee, I think. Anyway, so we do have this merchant-based economy that's largely going to see the exchange of these precious, of these luxury goods, but also of basic natural uh, kind of infrastructure resources, of stone, of, um, of um, building materials in general. But in terms of agriculture, we do see that in order to sustain a highly urbanized society, you need very complex forms of agriculture. So we do see that with this highly centralized state that has all these natural resources, they can build public works of infrastructure. They can build canals. They could build also what we call chiampas. And the chiampas, I'm mispronouncing, but the, another name for them are floating islands. They are artificial islands that will dot to Lake Texcoco and is kind of expanding farmable or arable land. Tenochtitlan and many of these city-states, it's gonna be a very urbanized society, as you can imagine. You need to sustain population through expanding where you can farm land. And in this case, they're farming land literally on the water. We do see that these city-states, they'll have populations upward to a million people and uh, kind of at their height before the Spanish get there. So in order to maintain their society, we do see the use of agricultural techniques, i.e. the building of floating islands. But we also do see the use of irrigation, of canals in general, kind of on the uh, edges of Lake Texcoco. And largely they're growing things like maize, corn, uh, beans. They also are raising turkeys. Yeah. So Lake Texcoco provides kind of not only the ability to trade, as you can kind of see with this image right here, but it also allows for agricultural production. So how did the Aztec govern their empire? That's something you should uh, answer. Pause the video now and uh, talk to your neighbor, talk to your whoever's in the room with you. And then why might this have led to social divisions in the Aztec empire? All right, so we looked at Mesoamerica, let's go to South America. And we're gonna focus on one region in particular, and that is going to be the Andes. So let's look at kind of Andean civilization and especially my favorite South American empire, the Inca. But first, geography, first geography. Well, let's look at why the Andes are terrible. Well, the Andes are good, don't get me wrong, but they are a difficult place to build a civilization. 
So in order to create societies, there will be half there, there will be have to. There are going to have to be adaptations. But let's first look at the difficulties. Well, the Andes are pretty cool mountains insofar as they're the you know, pretty high elevation in terms of uh, in terms of height. That was a stupid sentence. They're pretty high in terms of height. No. Well, the Andes are very difficult and rocky terrain given their very high elevation. It's very difficult to find adequate flatland to do agricultural work. This is kind of an exception right here. This is a, a valley in the Andes Mountains. So as such, we are going to have to see adaptations to this very highly elevated society. We also see that there's a limited amount of water, especially as you get further and further closer to, as you get closer, I should say, to the Pacific coast. The Andes, they kind of make a rain shadow where rain from the Amazon, rain from the Atlantic Ocean, they get holed up by the Andes mountains. And much of the uh, kind of societies we will see, they are gonna have to deal with the lack of rain, especially in arid, deserty environments. So how will civilizations in the Andes Mountains adapt? Well, they're going to do a few things. One of the most notable is going to be this practice of terrace farming. And terrace farming essentially is kind of carving the mountain to make these steps right here. And in these steps, you see the growing of crops. You can kind of see that better in this actual example right here. So we do see the building of terraces, and on these kind of different flatter regions, we see the growing of agriculture, of, of crops, I should say. So mainly things like corn, squash, beans, potatoes are a thing. Potatoes are from Peru, from South America. So we do see the kind of uh, building of the terrace farming system in order to accommodate for different groups of people. But we also are going to see that a lot of these cities, uh, uh, civilizations, I should say, they are going to build up irrigation structures. They are going to build aqueducts. They are going to use their natural environment, especially the snow-tipped Andes, to bring melted snow to lower regions through aqueducts. Much like the Aztec as well, they are going to form their societies largely around areas of water, especially uh, kind of mountainous lakes, the most famous being Lake Titicaca. We're all high schoolers here, or well, I'm not a high schooler. I'm, a, I'm an adult, don't laugh. Anyway, so we do have these kind of agricultural societies forming around areas with water, i.e. lakes. But we also see kind of a advantage that South America has that maybe Mesoamerica didn't, insofar as there are some beasts of burden. There are llamas to carry uh, agricultural, they're, they're serving as pack animals, essentially, to carry all of these goods to, uh, to places around the Andes. But also we have alpacas for fur. So everybody loves llamas. Let's talk about the premier Andean civilization, that being, of course, the civilization of the Inca. They go by um, kind of a different name, and unfortunately I cannot uh, pronounce it off the top of my head, but this is kind of what we refer to as the key Andean civilization, that being the Inca. So where do the Inca come from? Well, much like the Aztec, they are going to build upon the legacy of earlier civilizations in the region, especially these two kingdoms right here, the Moche and the Chimur empires. So these places are going to be kind of the inspiration politically, religiously, agriculturally for the Inca civilization itself. And the Inca, they are going to initially be a pastoral group of people, kind of like, in a way, the Aztec prior to getting to Tenochtitlan, where they, I forgot to mention this, but you probably are familiar with the story of how Tenochtitlan was founded, actually. And that's, you know, the, an eagle or whatever, a hawk was on a snake and a Mexican flag. I don't know. Now, it's an interesting story, but it's not relevant for us. Anyway, the Inca, they are going to settle down eventually. They are going to build up a city. It's Cusco. They are going to transition from a largely pastoral, nomadic lifestyle, herding llamas and alpacas, 
to one settling uh, near uh, mountainous lakes, i.e. Lake Titicaca. So we are going to see eventually that in order to kind of accommodate some cultural things that we'll talk about in a second, actually, we do see the expansion of the Inca Empire. So we do have uh, this guy right here, Patrick Kuti. He is going to expand the borders of the Inca Empire. And we do see a very complicated uh, imperial system that is forming under the reign of Pachit Kuti and future Inca emperors. So let's look at how uh, the Inca will govern their society. Well, much like the Aztec, it's a highly centralized government. There is a monarchy, there's an emperor. But how does this centralized monarchy govern? Well, they're going to, much like the Aztec, use a form of the tribute system. We do see that conquered people are expected to give some form of tribute to the Inca emperors. But as a difference between the Aztec and the Inca, we do see that the Inca are going to be a bit more aggressive in expanding the borders of their empire, especially because of cultural practices. And why is that? Well, in Inca culture, especially in royal culture, we do see this idea of split inheritance. Essentially, a king would have sons and the oldest son would become the next emperor, but the younger sons, they would get land. So in order to make sure there's enough unique pieces of land for all of the royal sons, we do see this very aggressive expansion. The Inca are going to expand much greater than what the Aztec did. The Aztec are mostly centered on like Texcoco, on, uh, on their city states. But we do see that the Inca empire is going to expand and be kind of more farther reaching than the Aztec empire was. And as such, kind of there will be attempts to unify diverse groups of people who have their own traditions, who have their own cultures. Remember, the Aztec, largely everyone has basically the same culture. They all have the same cultural origins and traditions. But here in the Inca Empire, a lot of these conquered places, they have their own unique styles of governing, their own unique cultural practices. So there will be some attempts to kind of account for this diversity. One of the most notable and something that everybody comments on, uh, everyone meaning from the Spanish invaders all the way to the college board who might be arguably worse. That was a joke. Obviously the college board hasn't committed genocide as far as I know. But there are gonna be complicated forms of unification efforts in the Inca empire infrastructure being the top and most premier of them, uh, most uh, notable of them. So we do see the development of a complicated imperial highway system. We do see the building of roads. This is one in modern day uh, Chile, I believe. So we do see a very complicated highway system that's allowing for imperial expansion, but also allowing for communication with the center of the empire the city of Cusco. We also are gonna see that there is the development of a common language in the Inca empire, one that is referred to as Quechua, which is going to be the basis for many Native American languages in this Western part of South America. But we also see that kind of like what we talked about with the Romans, like what we talked about with the Persians, that there's this idea that conquered people, as long as they pay tribute, as long as they're loyal to the emperor, they can have their own government. They can have their own form of local independence. <coughs> I need water. But they can have their own independence. And we call this notion the idea of having a client state. A client state is a conquered group of people who as long as they pay tribute, as long as they are loyal, they can continue their own form of domestic policy. Foreign policy is all in the hands of the Inca emperors, but locally things can continue as they were before. And oftentimes we do see that local traditions are respected. Women oftentimes hold high political positions in many of these conquered places. So there are some queens uh, that do rule over these client states as long as they pay tribute to the Inca emperor. 
But kind of as a caveat to all of this, even though they're allowing for independence, they do have this system of essentially taking a heir hostage. So whoever is going to succeed the local ruler, uh, they have to keep their heir at the imperial court in Cusco. They have to be kind of kept hostage until they succeed whoever they are succeeding. Anyway, so kind of in the Inca Empire, it is going to be less urbanized than the Aztec, at least as a whole. It's less populated. There's less population density. And many of the uh, most of the time, much of these uh, kind of local societies are going to be based on family or clan loyalty. So these local communities, these client states are tend to be ruled over by the traditions of family. So family is kind of the big basis for many of these rural communities in the Inca Empire. So there is kind of the ability to have more opportunities for women, if you want to look at that aspect of what that means. But we also see that politically, uh, I said that weird, politically, there is going to be more kind of self-rule than, say, the Aztec Empire. But kind of one of the other things that will create this very highly centralized monarchy is that there is going to be a system of labor known as the Mita system. And this is going to be kind of essentially a draft in which each community has to send at least a seventh of their male population to work for the government. So these government workers, essentially, they'd be in charge of building up infrastructure in the Inca Empire. So while the Aztec Empire is mostly, mostly, mostly reliant on slavery, we do see that the, in the Inca Empire, they have beasts of burden. They have al uh, llamas and alpacas to help them out. But we also have this form of kind of what we talked about earlier with Egypt, a corvée, meaning that there's a draft essentially where communities have to send a part of their workforce, part of their male workforce, to work on public infrastructure. So that's how the span, or excuse me, that's how the Inca are going to build up their empire. They are going to build highways. They're using the Mita system for public monuments, for terrace farming. So it's really a way to uh, create a unified empire through a highway system, but also by improving agricultural production. So the Mita system, actually, that's going to be something that the Spanish will continue once they get into Peru, once they get into uh, South America, to the Inca Empire. So it is an effective system. Uh, workers are paid for. Uh, they do receive some sort of compensation. And it isn't slavery because technically your service is over uh, once you're no longer needed. And I talked about before that Inca society is a bit more uh, less strict when it comes to strict gender roles. There are some political leaders, especially in the client state in these local communities based on family. In terms of culture, we do see kind of other aspects of Inca society. For instance, we see the uh, practice of polytheism. There is uh, a sun god. You can see him depicted there. Uh, Gold. But we also are going to see kind of other religious practices as well. We don't see, um, unfortunately, human sacrifice, but we do see ancestor worship. But we also see the building, much like the Aztecs, of monuments. We do see the building of the Temple of the Sun, for example. Uh, that is uh, in the city of Cusco. Eventually, it's converted into a church. The lovely Spanish do that. But we also see the building of a complex uh, uh, series of buildings called Machu Picchu. And I probably mispronounced that because I'm not a native question speaker, as, uh, as you might be able to tell. But it's a very complicated building, a series of buildings, I should say, this Machu Picchu. It is kind of a mixture between being a fort, between being a... Um, uh, between being a palace and a temple, it's a huge complex, high on the Andes. Uh, high on the Andes. 
So you should be able to compare the Aztec and the Inca, at least in terms of culture, in terms of politics, in terms of the economy, in terms of social developments. And finally, let's wrap up with uh, something that's a little closer to home. Let's talk about North America. And first, let's actually go to the American Southwest. So in the American Southwest, we are going to see a group of people referred to as the Anazazi. And they are kind of the cultural historic origin of many of the Native American societies that exist today in the Southwest, including groups like the Hopi, the Tolan Autumn, the uh, Yavapai, etc. Kind of, this is the origin for many of those societies, these Anazazi people. And they are going to develop several kind of uh, cultural and economic practices and political practices also that will be employed by Native American societies uh, that will, um, that exist today, obviously. Well, for one thing, we do see that the Anazazi will adapt to their natural environment. You all presumably live uh, in the American Southwest. So, you know, it's kind of a dry environment. If you, if you don't know that, then I don't know what, I don't understand your perception of the world if you haven't deduced that. This isn't funny, but anyway, it's a dry environment, as you might be well aware. So how do they adapt to that? Well, they're going to use our region's limited water resources by building up irrigation. We do see the building of communities largely along rivers, the Santa Cruz River, for example, the Colorado to an extent. And they are largely going to farm kind of things like corn, beans, squash. That's a similarity between many of these pre-Columbian civilizations. We also see that they will supplement their uh, food resources with hunting. But we do see that they are largely sedentary civilizations, that they are going to build up cities, dwellings, largely in places like canyons, largely in cliff dwellings. And two prominent examples of these, uh, of these communities, of these building communities, are Mesa Verde and Chaco Canyon. And these communities, they are very complex in terms of how they're built. They are kind of multi-story. There's an entryway, there's an upper part. Uh, there are multiple families kind of living in each story. So it is kind of a more, I don't want to say urbanized, but it is a more densely populated sedentary area. These are kind of small communities. Uh, but they are very complex in terms of how they're built. We do see evidence of road building. Uh, we also see the evidence of temples as well. And these are referred to as kivas. They're kind of underground temples where religious ceremonies take place. The Anasazi as a cultural group, as uh, in terms of uh, settle settlements like Mesa Verde and Chaco Canyon, they are going to decline probably because of outside invaders, but maybe because of climate change. We're not entirely sure. The desert, as you might be aware, is very volatile in terms of what can change overnight. And finally, let's wrap up today by looking at the Ohio River Valley and the Mississippi Valley as well. And that is going to be a group of people we refer to as the Mississippians. And this is a very broad term for a very broad culture that exists throughout the American Midwest mostly. So we do see that there will be the settlement of communities uh, much more urbanized than down there in the Southwest. We will see the building of settlements, very complicated ones across the Mississippi and Ohio River Valley. There's evidence even of trade with groups along the North Atlantic, with, uh, along the Atlantic coast. So the Iroquois, for example, we'll talk about them a bit more later actually. We do know that they're much like the Aztec, much like the Inca. There was this transition away from mostly nomadic civilization towards more sedentary ones. And that example of that is the Hopewell civilization. And largely Mississippian society is going to be very urbanized. There is evidence of kind of a mixture between trade and agriculture. There's trade, complex trade routes across the Mississippi River, the Ohio River, with other Native American societies. We know, of course, there's agriculture, mostly corn. It's supplemented with hunting and gathering as well. We know that there was kind of a complex 
uh, hierarchy in which there was a chief who served a religious and political role. We also know that there's the building of massive mon of monuments called burial mounds. And we can see uh, the remains of one right there and an artist's depiction of one down there. And the biggest of these uh, societies, of these trading urbanized societies is the city of uh, Kakoya. And this is kind of something that may or may not be on any potential test in the future. It's a city. It's a city that does exist, and it's an example of these complex trade and agricultural societies. And eventually, much like the Anazazi, the Mississippian culture probably declined because of climate change. There was floods along the Mississippi or the Ohio River. Um, there might have also been internal problems. We don't know exactly because there's not really evidence of a written record. Same thing with the Anasazi. Anyway, that wraps up North America. How did societies in North and South America adapt to their natural environment? You could use either the civilizations we just talked about, or you could use the Aztec slash Inca. All right, awesome. Have a great day. Uh, peace, love, rock and roll in the, uh, in the United States. Uh, no, hold on, hold on. Uh, rock and roll in the free world. Awesome. Bye.